Why hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 608, that is 608 of the Agostino Zynga show, I hope you are doing well wherever this podcast may be finding you, I hope you are doing stupendous, how am I, pretty decent, 12th day of sober October, essentially abstaining from drugs and alcohol and I feel pretty good and obviously increasing the workouts and reading and all that other extra stuff on top of it but for the most part the real brass bones of it the real the real kind of um basic groundwork to lay down on it is to make sure that i abstain from drugs and alcohol and so far it's been an absolute cinch to do i'm not gonna lie um it's also good because i've realized the amount of time i waste you know recovering from that stuff i think the actual activity itself isn't too bad i think for the most part how long am i drinking let's say maybe four hours five hours if that but the recovery after that is just horrendous even the come downs are way way worse than the actual height itself the height itself you're chasing a dragon obviously for the next hour or so right there's nothing like the first half of a pill or the first line or something after that it just gets a little bit like a downward thing it doesn't really go up anymore but for the most part the really the thing that really hurts me is definitely the alcohol for sure the next couple of days so these few days where i've been kind of you know basically clear-headed apart from the days that i basically stay up really late has been really nice i'm not gonna lie it's been extremely nice to the point where i'm thinking you know what as per usual every year when this happens i might need to do these more often um throughout the year and just kind of give myself a random month and just, just you know abstain come back in again abstain come back in again abstain and the good thing is for my own kind of um for my own um for my own sort of like mental and stuff it's nice to know that it's not something that's got a hold on me right it's not something that i kind of require in order to go out to these places that i go out such as nightclubs festivals uh, concerts and whatnot anything that requires me to go outside after 9 p.m it's good to know that i don't need to be you know drunk or high to enjoy them i can go to enjoy them just as you know as a gig or as an event and come back home with little to no worry so that's really nice because for a long time i thought oh crap i need to have these things in me in order for me to have a good time but considering my personality considering how i usually go about my life in terms of just doing the things i want to do when i want to do them it doesn't really make much sense really so i was probably um using it as an excuse to just do more stuff as opposed to actually needing to do it because you know if, if anyone can be comfortable in their own skin in any environment it's me so why would i then need an extra bit of help to kind of get me you know um to kind of get me comfortable in the space that I'm in it doesn't really make much much sense really so I'm glad I've kind of been able to sift through all that and basically call myself out on my BS and here I am now talking to you feeling good feeling well and I think the face is getting a bit slimmer also because of the lack of flipping booze which is absolutely horrendous to know that how much it flipping inflames your face but having kind of covered some comedians on here on this on, you know, on my channel in general it's good to know I've, I should have known better basically having covered some of those guys but hey what can you do Anyways, um, before we continue, I actually wanted to just quickly give a quick little roundup, a review of a night out that I had the other day where I went to Printworks here in London. And Printworks, if you don't know, is essentially a client club that we have here, basically our version of like a mega club, because I'm sure the capacity is way over 2000 or something. And it's basically um, a nightclub that's been, um, that's inside of a former print factory, hence the name Printworks. And if I'm not mistaken, it's just me going off memory and not Googling anything. If I'm not mistaken, the whole premise around Printworks when it first opened was that it was, I think the first sort of nightclub that opened just before the night tube or something like that. Um, because that you know at the UK in the UK for every reason in London we never had 24-hour tubes or even tubes that run you know a delayed service after 12 so you're basically effed if you went out in places and you couldn't get a train back you have to get a cab back or get a bus back which is super sketchy so if I'm not mistaken when Primax first opened the premise behind it was that hey we got this nightclub it's going to be in a former print factory we're going to completely blacken it out so it looks like you're in a dark dark nightclub with no windows and we're going to have it open from 12 p.m to 12 a no 12 p.m yeah to 11 p.m 
So it'll be like open throughout the day, throughout the evening, and then just before 12 when all the, or just before 11 or 12 before all the flipping last trains happen, because I think last trains in London are usually, you know, 10 minutes before 12 a.m. or something on it, on, on the weekday, then you could, you're could you able basically to go home. We're going to give you an hour grace to go home in that regard. That was the whole idea behind it. And it was a pretty sick idea, all things considered, because like I said, usually going out in London, if you stayed out after 12 before the night tube, you were basically effed and you had to kind of, you know, um, make sure you brought extra money with you for a cab or if worse comes to worse you have to get on a bus and you know maybe get groped maybe get beaten up or maybe just witness you know some other forms of violence and you know misery on that bus because usually there's all sorts of people that get on those buses after night people doing night shift people doing shifty things so it's not the best place to go so um anyway that aside that's when i kind of first kind of heard about it but obviously knowing me and knowing that i'm a fan of electronic music and dance music but mostly stuff on the underground side of things and mostly stuff that's not really the most commercially sounded because i don't think everything underground is great or i don't think everything commercial is crap but sometimes the commercial stuff is just so commercial it just doesn't even bother paying a ticket to go and watch it so i kind of avoided print words for the most part in that regard but there has been some occasions where some big djs who i like have played it which i've kind of regretted not going one show i regretted not going to or maybe two was a bicep show that looked incredible it looked like they put a lot of work into the flipping set design and all the lighting and the screens behind them and the other show also that i regret not going to was Skepta he had did a gig in Printworks randomly one night um, I think it was a random thing it might have been for that album Konnichiwa not really too sure but I remember seeing clips of it on Instagram at the time thinking damn and that would have been a great time to go to a place like that to experience it in a sort of different guy it's not a nightclub more of a gig but anyway I digress so this time around um, we decided to get tickets for a Dixon event Dixon obviously you guys will know is one of my favorite DJs and somebody that I've followed for many many years I think you know it's nearing Near, nearing on to two decades I've been following this guy um, you know just somebody I kind of look up to as a DJ as somebody to look up to as an artist as a business person and just someone that kind of operates in this dance music space really effortlessly right doesn't he doesn't really strain himself too much doesn't try too hard kind of presents himself in a really great way and has somehow been able to cultivate his label in a vision um, and everything he does in an extension in the same way too everyone kind of associated with in a vision is sort of kind of it's sort of cool someone you want to legitimately hang around with and I said many times on this podcast I think for the most part DJs are dorks you know probably myself included and they're not people that I'd really want to hang out with or spend any extra time with you know maybe there's some hot female ones here and there but for the most part the rest of them you know they're just they're just dorks really just enjoy the music whatever but don't try and get to know them because you'll probably end up being very disappointed but I had you know we had had some interactions with Dixon and Arm back in the day but for the most part you just go to these things as fans and just kind of enjoy them so this event was a trans Moderna event which is essentially Dixon's sort of like all all kind of immersive experience where he has these um um augmented reality type things going on really interesting things on the screens this time he had like a vr thing where you put a headset on and i, f I think he worked in conjunction with a particular graphic designer who built this really immersive world that you were kind of transposed in through these flipping um vr goggles which was sick it was the only you know the only downside about it is that we had to wait like a couple of you no know, maybe an hour and a half to get to get a try on them but once we did it it was definitely worth it especially if you're going to be in that event for like six plus hours it makes sense to kind of do those sort of things that they add on extra so that was pretty decent and for the most part because the queue wasn't moving that quickly every time people would jump in to kind of wait they'll sort of get disgruntled and then they'll leave so it kind of made it you know it kind of made it work in a way if that makes any sense so we finally got our headsets on and stuff and really experienced that for like only six minutes but it was really really good um especially for somebody that's a big fan of his so that was awesome but in general it was basically an opportunity for him to play all night and i've always been a fan of dixon's all night sets i think part of the law and part of the kind of appeal of dixon in the first place was that he was known um similar to like a solomon for playing these extended sets which is anything over six hours right where you're just playing for hours and hours and on end and usually in interviews Dixon will talk glowingly about these things he would say like you know these are some of my best sets ever where you kind of just go into a bit of a flow state where you're just kind of pumping out the tracks you're, you're going to really cool interesting directions you're taking your audience on a real real journey not people say the journey is a four hours no a real journey is plus six hours you're playing some interesting things you're throwing out some curveballs you're putting a few spanners in the works here and there it's just an interesting audio visual experience to kind of see you know 
in real time. So I'm a big fan of those type of events. So obviously Printworks, I thought would work really well for this sort of event because from what I've seen in the pictures, it is quite an immersive place when you go into it. Um, it kind of feels like it's sort of detached from the outside world. You kind of get transported into another world when you're going in there. But again, it was my first time going to Printworks. I've never been before. So it's near Surrey Quay Station. Um, and then, you, oh, there's a candle water? No, I think it's candle water station, sorry. But it's in the Surrey Keys area. So essentially, um, it takes a bit of a walk to get there. It's kind of like a 10 minute walk, I'd say. But everything's sort of signposted to get you into the direction of tra of uh, print works. Along the way, too, there's, there's these kind of um, wardens with their little high vis vests on. So you kind of know you're going the right way. And then a the few sandwiches come up. Then, as you get to the main gate that takes you into the flipping site, they ask you for your ticket. So already, if you don't have a ticket, they don't really let you in at that point. So they kind of want to just see your ticket they see it you get let in and you continue walking into this main sort of uh you know area where print works is which is essentially on a massive site and you're kind of walking for a little bit and then you go into another door that then leads you into the main site and then you get checked again for the tickets and you have to get searched which isn't too shabby the search wasn't too aggressive even though you had to put everything on a tray you put your belongings on a tray they scan you with the metal detector they just pat you down and then you pick up your belongings and you carry on and then as you go through the main security bit you don't realize oh wow this place is massive there's on the left hand side there's a huge food court where you can basically buy you know different types of food like pizzas burgers um there's people selling like greek type food where it's just like you know um, what's that thing called gyros or gyros i forgot what it's called um where it's like a pitta and you put like uh, chips in it with like meats and stuff and you can even wrap it and eat it like that or you can just like you know eat it from the box so that was pretty sick to see and there's also a bar outside with a seating area and obviously everyone's smoking out there and whatnot and that was absolutely ram when we went there so i'm not sure if people go to print works just to jam because that's a quite a cool little space because it's a you don't really get those sort of spaces where you can be outdoors and smoking and dancing and listening to cool music coming through the speakers yeah i mean it's, so people maybe just sit there for the most part because they look really comfortable but then we went back inside again and then you have to kind of go up some stairs to head to the main room where there's a sign that basically say music that kind of leads you towards it. And I have to be honest, on my first entry into Printworks, it was kind of underwhelming sound wise. I think you go through such a you go you go through such a journey kind of getting there right from the station all the way there it kind of rem it kind of made me oddly weirdly enough which i shouldn't because i should know better it kind of made me think of Berghain when you get off the train station at whatever train station you get off there's always a little walk you have to kind of go through right and then you're kind of you know you get up there you're in the queue you're on your best behavior you're trying not to act drunk or so but drunk or high um and then you're hearing the music kind of bleeding through the walls of the club you see the silhouettes of people dancing through the windows and whatnot then when you go in you get searched you walk up the stairs and you hit the main burger and dance floor and it's just whoosh, it's like a wave and it just hits your face and i was expecting i think the same thing i think my my uh, receptors in my body were basically tingled when i went through that journey because it all might make me remember what i usually go for when i go to Berghain. and then when i went into the main room and i was met with what i could describe as like active monitor speakers you know those types where you you buy when you want to do like a barbecue party outside in the garden somewhere you want to play some music and you have these active speakers you put in two at two corners of the flipping garden and have it kind of pointing towards the crowd and the further away you are the kind of less good it, the less nice it, hit, it sounds the further you are the kind of warmer it sounds and more kind of surrounded sounds and more basic it sounds that's basically what i got from print works the sound was absolutely caca really bad and considering the high level of dj that was playing there in dixon considering the amount of work they put into the set design and having these amazing led screens which i immediately thought at first watching them i thought they were screens as in like actual plasma screens but if you look closely it's just really small amounts of leds that obviously they kind of you know um uh get images pulled up on there or graphics and stuff and it kind of all kind of light up the bulbs differently or whatnot so it's pretty sick technology all together um and the work obviously those vjs and lighting people do there was a whole team of them sat there maybe i'd say maybe 10 people maybe more doing all that stuff and working it so clearly a lot of work went into it so to go into a place like that and see all that work and it, the sound to be so shitty was that huh 
And then also the dance floor area is kind of weird because it's a print works, I guess. So it's on the main print work where the printing factory, I guess, would be. And it's sort of like this kind of gangway thing, this like really narrow kind of corridor, which you might have seen in the, the Batman movie, Robert Pattinson. That's the one where he goes in this nightclub and he's fighting all the guys. It was filmed in print works in London. So it's that kind of, but he was on the balcony, one of those kind of, but he was on the main dance floor. So it's really thin, but then all the sides are open. So I guess maybe that's the reason why the sound isn't that great. It doesn't insulate well. Maybe they'd, they'd be a better off having cart, cart, cartons, curtains or something that they could kind of close to keep the sound in there or something like that. I don't know, something along with I don't know what it is, but the sound just bleeds through the entire place and it just sounds really tinny, really airy, and it just didn't sound that great. But by the time we got to the front, and started really shocking out, raving and stuff, and maybe they improved the sound. I don't know what happened. Maybe you, I, your ears got used to it. It did sound a little bit better, but it didn't sound the greatest. I'm not going to be honest. So I think for like £35, you know, for the tickets, which uh, ho luckily I didn't pay for um, because I was given one uh, by a friend who, who didn't end up going. But if I did have to pay for it, I would have been a little bit pissed. It was nice to see Dixon play, obviously, for that set amount of time. It's great. Probably he's worth that money alone, his entry fee. But as a club experience, it's probably a bit of a wasted opportunity. Um, the sound was just not that great. And maybe because I was sober, I was kind of noticing it a little bit more than I would have noticed if I was drunk and high. But that was one thing that kind of left me a bit disappointed. And then at the end, when we did leave... Um, I guess because it was so full in there and I think it was a sold out event if I'm not mistaken they then made us leave through a completely different exit so it required, basically required us to do like a different lap around this, the kind of you know site and go to go back to where the station is which then took a further long a longer time to get there because my feet were killing me and shit it was just annoying it was a bit of an annoying night I'm not going to lie towards the end I kind of wasn't I kind of couldn't wait to get home but then the next day I was kind of you know I was kind of chuffed that I kind of was able to go. I'm not going to lie. So I've got a clip here that kind of illustrates a little bit of what I saw inside. So I'm going to play it for you guys so you can kind of get a vibe of what the deal was when I was there. So as you can see from the lights on the video, if you're not watching the video, then please, I do apologize, but check out the video on YouTube if you do get a chance to. The video and the light work in there is absolutely amazing. They do a really good job. Like you can tell there's a dedicated team that do it. It's not just some plug-in thing that's linked to the mixer and stuff that just plays off of what the tunes are playing. It's like people are actually going through it and, you know, doing the actual work, whatever it is. I don't know how they do this stuff, but it was actually like someone put a lot of effort into it. So that was pretty sick to see. Let me skip ahead and play another clip. As, as you can see it's really dark in there so it's completely blacked out you do like honestly feel like you're in some underground bunker by the time you do get out it's kind of like trippy your eyes kind of get readjusted to the light so it is pretty immersive but like i said the sound is just not as good as it probably should be for a mega club like that <laughs> Skip again. This is basically towards the front, which is basically yeah, to the left of the stage, which is Dixon's right. This is where we basically stood for the most of the night. Probably the worst place to stand because we were standing right next to the wall, which basically was the main gangway that everyone was kind of walking down. Bit of a mistake that way. But what it was good for was that there's a little bit towards the clip here where you see the one of the screens, the LED screens. Earlier on that night, or maybe around the same time as, as I was filming this, some crazy dude decided to climb up one of the speakers um, that they have in Printworks. If you've been there before, you'll see them. It's sort of like a stack of speakers they have, but they're kind of encased in this sort of like barbed cage thing, which looks pretty cool, but obviously it's used to kind of hold them together so they don't fall on anybody. So this kid decided to climb up that cage thing, which is really high. It goes all the way up until one of the balconies, and he was on the top of that speaker with his top off doing handstands and stuff. Stuff, like press doing handstand press i don't know if it's a crossfit or something or just some really buff black dude who was into flipping um calisthenics but he was doing 
flipping handstand push-ups. He was doing that thing where you do a put where you do the handstand and you sort of like start moving your legs like you're on a bicycle. Some nutty stuff. And at first, we all thought, oh, he's part of the show because earlier on there was a woman on the, that was doing a strip uh, a pole dancing routine behind Dixon. Right, they got all the VIPs away from the back of the behind him and stuff, and they put this pole up, and the screen was you know had this great light on it i think it was yellow or something and she was just there like you know her silhouette dancing on a pole and doing these amazing things and kind of matching the beat of this music and it was sick really was amazing and then we thought that was the same thing because of that guy was on the thing we thought he was part of the show then obviously because the security guards were reacting really aggy and they were all running up there waiting to kind of pull him up and kind of you know put arms elbows and knees on him we thought okay he's not part of the show and then when he did finally because i thought at first he was intimating like he went to maybe move out of the way i thought he's going to jump down i was like, oh my god shit if he jumps down and he buckles he could end up flipping banging his head or breaking his leg i was thinking it's going to be horrible to watch but instead he jumped up onto the balcony. Then as soon as he went over the balcony, the security guards dragged him to the floor, were strangling him and stuff. Like, it was brutal. It was definitely one of those things that if you were high or drunk, it would have definitely been our vibe killer. But because I wasn't, I was just laughing the whole way through, talking to some other girls in there who were kind of a bit shocked at it as well and kind of trying to make them laugh too, not to take it too seriously. And it was just like a bit of a funny comedic moment there. But God damn it, man, Dixon has that effect on people. He makes them want to, you know, climb up flipping speakers and do handstand push-ups and stuff. I wonder if he saw it when he was on the decks. Did he see it that far? Because maybe it was too far away from him to see, but I wonder if he did end up seeing it. But it was absolutely gnarly to watch. I'm not going to lie. Let me play a little bit more of the clip. Yeah, and, and that's the LED things, right? So I thought at first these were screens, but they're not. They're actually just rectangles with little small LEDs that they, I guess, still can project images or whatever onto. It's pretty sick, man, that kind of technology. I'm assuming these things aren't cheap, but these are really cool. I'd love to have them in a home somewhere. Maybe not the best home furniture. I'm thinking about it like a dude, but it's definitely something that I would uh, love to see more in other, cl in other clubs for sure. <laughs> Oh, and the other thing that was really good, the sound was terrible. Like I said, let's not with the sound, but the production was awesome. They had this screen right here. So there's a screen behind Dixon where he's, where he's playing that can also like pivot. So the screen was like, um, I don't know, let's say it's red. So it pivoted like that and it went on top of him. So it kind of looked like, do you know the lights out? Is it Watergate? I think it might be Watergate. Let me see if I can get him up on here. I think it's a lights out Watergate. Let me see. There's a nightclub in Berlin. Is it Watergate, Berlin? Maybe it's Watergate. Let me see. But it kind of reminded me a little bit of Watergate, where they have those lights that are on top of you, that sort of like beam across. Yeah, I think it is Watergate. It is, it is, it is, it is. So they've got a screen. Sorry, they've got a screen behind um, the, behind the DJs, with the DJ booth, that can basically pivot and kind of you know scoot over the top of the dj so it's sort of like flat on top of you and they can basically just shine light on it so the whole time they had the thing the same color as all the other lights that were around so it was like a red or a yellow and it was just beaming the whole time it was so hypnotic to watch and it kind of did remind me of the watergate lights that they have as well right these lights where they're sort of like on top of the where it's sort of like running the whole way of the flipping club which is probably a better effect but still just see that in real life was super super amazing i'm not going to lie so that's definitely something that i think is maybe worth the money to check out and i think in general anyway printworks isn't corsica studios it's not fold it's not um peckham levels it's not you know color factory it's not you know club 9294 all these kind of like clubs that people go to on like a weekly basis it's probably a place that you should maybe you know have booked in for like a big event if you want to see like a big marquee dj that's probably a good reason to go there and if you do go there you will get a fully produced show like they'll put some effort into making it uh visually stimulating the only thing is obviously like i said the sound is just a bit of a letdown but i definitely think that was definitely something i would say was a good thing and then the other good thing i really enjoyed about it was a crowd because we've been to a lot um, a few of these maybe a, not a lot a few a few um, of these events um, with Innovisions and you know their kind of extended family and for the most part they're sort of only run by the same kind of people for the most part there are some exceptions here and there but they're run by the same sort of people and the same sort of crowd comes which makes complete sense but it usually isn't the greatest for me personally and I think unfortunately um, London wise or the UK our club nights are kind of 
dictated mostly by the crowd. As great as it is to get good lineups and to have place club you know, parties and good you know clubs and spaces, usually a lot of the fun of going to a nightclub is kind of predicated by the people that go in there. And because we don't have a door picking kind of culture in the UK, and basically, if as long as you have money, you can go into any sort of establishment. It kind of means that nights out are really fifty fifty. You know, you don't know if you're going to have a good night. You kind of have, just have to go and hope for the best. Whereas places like Berlin, because obviously they take clubbing very seriously, of course, and they also they have that door picking culture. It sort of lends to you having it being more likely you're going to have a good time than you're going to have a bad time, regardless of who's putting on a night. But this time I felt like because Transmoderna is maybe a more general, maybe because it's Dixon, maybe because Transmoderna, maybe because it's own show. It wasn't tied with the other group that do the innovation shows. It just felt a little bit more looser. The crowd was way more varied. I saw different, way more different age groups of people than I would at the other events we went to. And the people were just safer way nicer we got, got speaking to a group of girls at the front that were really nice a couple of dudes that we bumped into from other other places that we saw one dude in particular was super psyched to see us so that was pretty sick to see who kind of recognized us out of the blue um but yeah I, I definitely enjoyed the crowd there way better and i think even the bartenders were nice as well considering how big of a place it is and the amount of absolute spanners they have to deal with on a regular basis the print work flipping bartenders were absolutely brilliant very attentive very fast um very easy to kind of you know communicate with you know how much you need to communicate with somebody in a nightclub i know but you know just the general things that kind of can kind of affect your nights out and snap you out of the zone that you're in especially if you're high or drunk but yeah all in all had a good time um just annoying the journey back home but it was quite nice to get back home before 1 a.m i'm not gonna lie so that whole idea behind print works opening from like 12 p.m to 11 p.m is just genius yeah, it gives you time to get back on a regular train um you don't have to wait for a night bus and you get home at a decent hour like at 1 a.m ish you can maybe have a glass of water drink some tea and go to bed it was absolutely beautiful so i'm not going to complain about that in the slightest oh but the only other thing that's funny was the was the flipping kids outside selling flipping nitrous oxide or the laughing gas and stuff or the balloons you just go outside all year but yeah um, that was that was quite hilarious and especially considering it was a pretty residential area on the other side of where we were kind of let out you see there's loads of houses and flats around print work too so you can just imagine what that must be like for people that work there people that live there sorry day to day to kind of hear that nonsense going on all day long but i guess it's a good thing that it ends at 11 p.m you know, you know regular clubs stay open until four so maybe you have to kind of count your blessings in that regard and also you know you move there knowing full well what it's about so you can't complain um, next on the list I wanted to talk about here quickly is yeah let's go with this one so as most of you know um, Quavo and Takeoff just released an album called Only Built for Infinity Links and there's a whole lot of kind of backstory that goes into this because most of you will know that the Migos have unfortunately broken up it looks like indefinitely and we didn't really know why it happened and then um, when yeah we didn't really know why it happened and some few weeks after we don't saw Offset having some public outbursts some public um, decisions disputes with QC no with Q sorry um, one of the people involved with QC and then immediately kind of everyone's thoughts went towards business you know maybe you know he didn't like the extension contract or the renewal or whatever something to do with record label contracts um, but for the most part it hasn't really been confirmed in any way shape or form so then when rumors started to swirl around that I think randomly this rumor kind of popped up in the midst of Cardi B going beefing with some Nicki Minaj stan or something I think that's how basically it came about and then I guess she mentioned something about her husband and then that guy said hey let's not talk about husband your your husband is currently you know cheating on you with sweetie or something and everyone's like huh because that was the first time we ever heard their two names linked together and obviously because Quaver was dating sweetie at one time and they were in a pretty serious relationship it just seemed a little bit crazy that that would happen and then I guess the lack of clarification or rebuttal or clearing up of that rumor basically led everyone to believe okay cool that definitely ended up happening and then we ended up having the leaked track from one from this album where basically Quavo says it you know in non certain terms that essentially the gang or the group broke up because of an itch and their itch being sweetie um it kind of led you know me to believe that this album would definitely end up being one of his best unfortunately as a fan again i'm a big fan of quaver big fan of takeoff i think takeoff's album was actually incredibly overlooked sort of like it reminded me of like um when diddy dropped last train to paris right and i don't think a lot of people kind of 
you know, really gave it the credit it was due until maybe many, many years later, people visited that album back and forth. You know, this album's actually slaps. I think the same thing goes for Takeoff's album. It's actually really good, especially when you consider that some people might think he's the quote unquote weakest member of the group. The fact that he's able to put together a really cohesive album that sounds distinctively like him was really something I kind of was kind of taken aback by. The only thing I was really disappointed by was Quavo's solo album solo kind of outing the album he did with travis scott was really lackluster and everything after that too in terms of his own singles didn't really hit the way they meant to hit i think they even knew it themselves because i think they would assume quavo to be beyonce of the group and it didn't it didn't connect the way they thought it would connect i think people still like him as part of the group maybe on features but as a solo artist he hasn't necessarily grabbed anyone's attention but i did think myself that most of it had to do with them just being not say lazy but kind of um, resting on their laurels right they were so successful at one point riding on that wave all their verses were hitting all their tracks were slapping you know you can kind of just you know kind of go through the motions and I guess when you go through a pretty public breakup like Quaver did with Sweetie there was that video of them in the lift arguing and fighting and stuff and rumors of cheating and him basically repoing the car that he gave and all this sort of nonsense and it can only mean that the mu that's going to get pulled into the music all that frustration all that heartache all that turmoil all that stress will definitely go into the music and for the most part most artists whether it's they're losing somebody very close or they're or a relationship ending or they're going through a really difficult time in their career or their personal life whatever it may be usually means that music's going to slap so it's no surprise for me that the opening track of this album right the opening track of this album which is called two infinity links has maybe one of the best quaver verses you've ever heard in my opinion anyway as well especially if i'm being a fan um because he goes absolutely in on it he snaps on this verse and it starts off with, um, the, this is verse one, I'm going to read it out. Hopefully I don't sound like an absolute idiot. It says, I promise to always rep my city, especially where I'm, especially where I'm from. Go. Want to come back to the hood and put you on. You don't have to overcrumb. Just put little bro on son. Just put little bro on son. Don't put that hoe on nothing. Don't put that bitch on nothing. I never want to see the day I lose my bro to one. Before the cake, before the stage, we used to split honey buns yo when i heard that i thought okay it's confirmed that definitely something happened with fucking sweetie and bloody offset that led to a group breaking up which is because this is essentially him crying about it he's upset that the group had to break up over a girl he's like this is what we should have never done we're legit family we used to split honey buns and now we're breaking up over girls that only are messing with us because we're famous we know what the game is you shouldn't be in that kind of vibe it's kind of, that's what it kind of sounds like it doesn't even sound like him being like oh i want to run a fade with this guy it's on site it's more like disappointment like god man really you let a girl come come between us and a girl like this especially it's like Phew. And it says it five thirty, mama house, we was all sons. Mama, eighty five north, where we're all from. Migo, if it wasn't for P shit, it probably wouldn't be no me. True story. And if it wasn't for me, shit, it probably wouldn't be no QC. Uh huh. Just some young rich niggas trying to get out on the streets. Oh, it's so hard. <laughs> Can't let bitches, can't let money, ego come between the team. I'm getting pissed while I'm listening to this shit. I can't believe. See, I knew it. This is honestly the passion and the aggression has all been fed into the opening track of the album. The opening track of the album is really spazzing. He continues that I fell for a bitch. I tried to knock me off my pee. What you see, look at me. What you think, I'm a bitch. Fuck them M's, take a brick, make a bill in this bitch. This is what you call one of the greatest Quavo verses of all time. And he absolutely snapped on this. Like one of the greatest. And I do recommend checking out the entire album. It's, um, it maybe starts off a bit strong and then kind of tails off towards the end. But I still think as a project outside of the Migos, this is definitely the strongest thing they've put out so far. Anyone associated with them. Obviously, take like I said, Takeoff's album I thought was really underrated, but I guess a lot of people won't essentially like it. Quavo's records and albums and joint stuff he did with Travis was a bit meh. But outside of the traditional Migos uh, no, trio, this is definitely one of their strongest things to date. And they really complement each other really well. So I'm really, really a big fan of it. I really recommend you check it out. Um, it's definitely one of my favorite albums to come out recently as well. And there's a really good Young Fug verse and Gunner verse as well. And it's like, it's, it slaps. The whole thing slaps. Only built for Infinity Links. Check it out by Quavo and Take Off available on all your regular, you know, digital streaming platforms. You know where to get it. You know where to get it.
Next, I want to quickly talk about hip hop performers and the lack of effort that goes into performing some of these incredible songs that we all kind of rock out to in gyms, that we all rock out to when we're running, on the way to work, you know, on the way to a link, just walking around, hoovering the house, whatever it may be. We love these songs, right? We put them in our playlist, we bang them out, we stream them again and again and again, and we hope some of those streams will add to dollars and pennies or whatever in the artist's pocket, whatever it may be. But for some reason, well, I don't know what it is about hip-hop, especially nowadays, where I think a few of the tracks or the beats or the producers are a little bit formulaic, right? The songs themselves, the, the kind of the beats or the production on the, on the, of the music isn't the most um, expansive, right? It doesn't go in interesting places. It just kind of is usually these eight-bar loops and stuff looped around with some bridges here and there, but it's not that crazy. So with it not being that crazy and with the bars being as simplistic as they've ever been especially some of our greatest rappers are having to dumb shit down because people don't necessarily like the wordy wordy stuff unless you are really into that kind of backpack um rappy rappy stuff but for the most part people just want easy digestible kind of turn up music if that be if that is the case i don't think any artist nowadays has an excuse to perform a record like kodak black did um at the hip b to hip-hop awards he's flipping stand-up track super gremlin and perform it with a vocal backing track that's a crime. And if you're wondering what a vocal backing track is, it's basically when you a performer goes on stage and basically just has the DJ play the MP3 of the song that you can hear on iTunes right now, and they just rap over the actual lyrics of the song playing. And you can kind of hear a little bit of it here. So essentially you hear his voice um, screaming and screeching over the actual MP3 itself. So it kind of doesn't necessarily, um, you know, describe or give you a real live experience of a song and i think it's a real shame because the times you do see artists go on stage especially rappers and rap their actual songs it adds a different dimension to the actual performance people can sing along to it a little bit better it gives it a different sort of vibe when you're live and it just slaps better it just is what it is but for whatever reason these guys i think it's mostly laziness because i don't think when they record they, they have the instrumental to hand they should just record as they're making as they're producing the record they're recording at the same time so there is no stem of this without any vocals and then to go back and take the vocals off you know require money and get an engineer involved to mix it down again so it sounds perfect and most rappers don't want to do that so if you're going to perform at a live show or go and do a tour you know you could basically pocket all the money if you just hire your guy to kind of quote unquote dj and basically press you know you know play on the tracks that you tell him to press play on and pause on the ones you don't tell him to press pause on and then you basically get to pocket all the money because all you need to do is bring your guy with a laptop uh a midi you know a, a midi controller of some sort that can plug into the what you call it to the sound system and you're basically ready to go but if you have to hire in a sound engineer you have to have to hire in a band all this sort of stuff it obviously adds money and kind of gets cuts into your profit margin so that's why our rappers don't do it but i think considering how amazing super gremlin is as a track considering the story behind it that you know kodak was a little bit cold at the time that he was releasing the song and needed something to kind of get himself back out there hot on the streets and to remind people how talented of a rapper and a songwriter and a lyricist that he is and super gremlin comes out and absolutely slaps for it to you to perform that and perform it with a vocal backing track is just i'm not liking it man not in the slightest and even the stage presence of the dancers and stuff was a little bit too much i think there's too many on there maybe he needed to have maybe four or eight of them but to have so many of those dancers in the back with the little banner clubs on and the thing was just a bit too much for me it just kind of distracted from the performance overall he didn't need to have all that stuff so the the lack of vocal backing track would have definitely helped to the performance but again there's just a there's just a bunch of laziness i think involved the hip-hop in, in general and i think it's really disappointing because with it being the number one genre in the world and with kids flipping you know absolutely obsessed with it it would kind of it's a bit of a disservice to the fans especially the ones who are paying to see you live because they're paying a little bit extra to just go there and perform it you know like that with the back intro the vocal back and track there and you know you just screaming over the record it doesn't add to the experience i think one of the main culprits of that for me is definitely playboy carty who i'm a big fan of but his music has hardly any lyrics on it right um he's saying the same things again and again and again why not just like have an actual instrumental playing and actually perform it with your actual voice so you can hear you breathing hear you being out of breath hearing you losing your hearing you screeching and squealing properly that sounds so much more amazing but nowadays for him 
his live show is kind of like he's he's kind of like an MC of his song so they have the stage design with the mountain and all the smoke and the guy playing guitar and him coming out in that car thing that Kanye gave him but essentially it's him basically being an MC for his own rave for his own live performance he kind of screams over it come on get it get it ah, all this stuff but he's not really rapping um his lyrics or anything along those kind of lines which is really strange considering that so many kids love to go to his shows, myself included, and go in the mosh pit and get absolutely crazy. When in reality, he's not really providing you the show. He's just playing you the music on a really big sound system and you're surrounded by other fans who are obsessed with him as much as you are. Maybe that's the thing. I don't really know. But anyway, what can you do? What can you do? Next on the list, I'm going to talk about this, courtesy of Janet, <laughs> Janet, courtesy of Mixed Mag. It's pretty interesting here. This is courtesy of Mixed Mag. It says the following, Janet Jackson was spotted partying at London's Corsica Studios. Absolutely crazy, right? Um, it says here, pop diva Janet Jackson was spotted in South London, Corsica Studios, attending um, an Igloo night. Igor Records founder Alexander Nutt shared an image with a five Grammy Award winner saying, Can Janet Jackson came through, adding she was awesome. As she sings in the chorus of a hit track, Anytime, any place, I don't care who's around. Janet Jackson was also rumored to have been at Shoreditch House earlier the night before. The LD, uh, the end founder of Frequency Records, tweeted Janet Jackson was at the Igloo Records night at Corsica last night. That's how influential Alexander Nutt is, DJing in the label, partying, including the likes of Tony Touch, Mark, DJ Tara, Helen Star, Mr. Finger, and Aquia. Alexander now has since added to a story said, I don't know where to start last night. Cusco Studio was truly something special. I'll write a proper post about it tomorrow once I get the photos available. But for now, I just want to send a huge thanks to OG Legend. Da, 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 da. DJ Tara tweeted um, a thread about the night, calling it amazing, concluding that it was Jane Jackson was there. And everyone's obviously going crazy about Janet Jackson being in this establishment. And it immediately made me think, it immediately made me think, immediately made me think of the most famous person that I've seen in a nightclub. And weirdly enough, these two famous people I saw in nightclubs, or maybe actually three, as a list, three famous people I saw in nightclubs were all in the same nightclub. So for a period of my life, I was obsessed with this nightclub in Dawson called The Alibi which was one of the best sort of like um, basement dive bars I've ever been to in my entire life, even to this day. And I kind of, when I go to different places around the world and I, I always do this, I'm not sure if you guys do the same thing, but I always kind of look for dive bars and I'll kind of search for one that's got like one star to three stars and go to the shittiest one I can go to. And usually it's a hell of a good time. You can usually pick up from there. You can usually hear some good music, get chatting to some fucking funky locals and stuff. And it's just, you know, can add a different sort of layer and a texture to your, holiday you know that you're out on so I'm always been you know obsessed with dive bars in general but you know with my love for the yellow bite kind of extended over that so um I met three or bumped into three of the most famous people that I've ever done in that kind of establishment which is absolutely wild but it does make sense because at the time the alibi was maybe the number one destination to kind of go to if you visited London even though some of the parties weren't the best and whatever it may be just kind of being there and being seen and being around these certain people was definitely a major part of people's kind of um, London experience and the first person who I saw there was none other than Harry Styles. Harry Styles, I don't know how old he was, how long ago it was, it was a very, very long time ago. But the one thing I remember about him is he was incredibly, incredibly nice. Like, we weirdly nice. Like, he was just there with some friends, having some drinks, hanging out at the bar, chatting up to some, chatting up some girls, or the girls chatting him up. And the one thing I noticed, because I remember I was sitting in next to the bar, one thing I noticed was that he made time for everybody. And after I remember kind of seeing what a celebrity life is like in real life and then what, see, you know, basically realizing that I'm definitely not cut out for that lifestyle because every time he was kind of getting into a conversation or enjoying a drink or sharing a laugh, someone will come for a picture, come for a picture, come for a picture. And it wasn't even at the times where I think social media is probably worse than it is ever, right? In terms of people being intrusive and feeling like, you know, if they see you, you kind of owe them um, the, the time to kind of stop and kind of give them attention. But back then, people were even harassing him and stuff. And the alibi was known for people getting completely off their heads. So you can imagine somebody completely off their heads, remembering to kind of get out their phone, take a picture. It's not well. The place is really dark. The flashing go off, all that sort of nonsense. So, but one thing I did see with him is that he stopped and made time for everybody. Nothing was a chore the entire night. He was incredibly nice. He even got us some drinks. Oh no, he bought us some shots actually when we were at the bar. So that was pretty decent. And then the other person who I saw there, um, quite soon after, was... Um, What's her name? I've got. I keep forgetting her name. White lady, Jessica Alba. 
I saw Jessica Alba randomly in Yalabai. She looks very understated. She kind of had her hair up in the ponytail. I remember she was wearing glasses. I think she wears glasses day to day, I think, if I'm not mistaken. And she had like a coat on. And she was coming down the stairs as I was going up. And people were kind of saying hi to her and stuff. And one thing I realized straight away with these Hollywood types, especially when it comes to the females, she looked incredibly attractive in real life probably more so than in pictures because she looked really understated really understated really underdressed like i said hair back ponytail on in the ponytail with glasses on wearing a big jacket she wasn't dressed in some bodycon dress with some with a bum kind of out and stuff no she just looked very 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 plain looking and she still stood out maybe because i recognized her face straight away but she still stood her face was like wow duh, that woman's incredibly attractive and then boom i realized oh shit that's jessica alba and then the other person who I saw in Yalabai, the most famous person who I saw, he was actually in there filming a scene for a, for a movie that I don't remember which one it was, but essentially in the movie, he kind of comes into a club and he's sort of like spotting people and looking for somebody. And that was, whatever that movie is I'm thinking of, Jake Legitimate was in, that was actually filmed in Yalabai. And he had like a guy behind him who had just like one camera. They were just basically trying to get an authentic shot of him going through a club. But unfortunately, he's too famous. Everyone was kind of saying hi to him, but they were probably managed to able to chop up the clips and make it kind of work. So essentially, yeah, that's who I saw. I saw Jake Gyllenhaal, the Yalabai. And he kind of walked, walking in and he actually did, spud me for the scene but i was obviously looking at the camera like you know with my eyes as big as cds having done probably three and a half grams of mdma or something so i probably didn't make the cut for the movie but he definitely did give me a little bit of a pound but it was in a, i don't know what scene it was it was some scene or some movie that he's in where he's in a nightclub and he's kind of parading through whatever maybe if you know it you probably be able to tell me in the comments but those are the two most famous people i saw and again three harry styles jessica alba and jake Gyllenhaal all in the alibi, all in one place, one bloody place. Um, so that was pretty cool to see. So for the most part, London is like that. Do you know what I mean? It's, uh, it, as, bad as, it, as bad as I complain about the clubbing scene and the fact that it's not an all-night city, really. Most places close at four. I think Corsica is another one, like four that closes at six. So it's another rare one. I think every area has one place that closes at 6 a.m., but they're kind of far out. You kind of have to commit to going to those kind of places. You can't really club hop and stuff. And after six, everything is basically done. Basically, people return back to normal life. But the one thing that is really amazing about our club night or our clubbing scene in general is a variety of what we have available. There's so much variety out there from... I speak to someone the other, the other day. You could go out essentially in parts of London and go and basically rave to metal music. You can go rave to pop punk music, go rave to um what do they call it? Uh reggae, go live to, go rave to bashment, grime, you know, hip hop, UK rap, whatever, Afro beats, Afro house, um and my piano, there's loads of nights out there catering to every type of music genre that you want. But it's just, you know, the options in terms of staying out late aren't really there. Maybe they're in sketchy places or whatever maybe. But in terms of actual genres that they cover, there's nothing better than London. So it does make complete sense why a incredibly talented artist like Janet Jackson with the musical legacy that she has would be attracted to come down to London and kind of see the vibe and see what it's about. Because imagine, someone said she was at Shoreditch House. So... Uh, I don't know if she was there earlier that night or if she was there the night before, but still, she was in Shoreditch House having a nice bougie night out. They have some decent DJs that play there. Um, I've been there a few times on, on like Friends, recommendations and whatnot, and it's a pretty decent place to go and hang out in, especially if you've got some money. I'm assuming it's probably some fun. So to leave the place like that and to go to a grimy club like Corsica in the depths of South London, that means you're really about this life. That means you really want to experience, you know, London club scene for real, for real and to go to an igloo night records too kind of shows it so definitely i'm not surprised somebody like her would be into that kind of thing i'm not really surprised in the slightest but it definitely was something that i am um that i'm happy that these people got to enjoy and got to see no 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 way about it let me see, what's this to dj tara fred what is this let's see the, the the fred by this person called dj tara but yeah, I'm not surprised to see Janet Jackson out there in London enjoying herself because, you know, we have some of the best club nights in the world, actually, in the world. Maybe not the best clubbers, maybe not the best clubs, maybe not the best clubbing scene in general, but in terms of the flipping nights, now we smash it, man. No one can come close to us. I don't care. No one can come close to us. Um, what was I going to say here? Why do I recognize this lady in the middle? I don't know why. Okay, I'm not a recognized person, but I, rec I do recognize that lady in the middle. I don't know why I recognize her, to be honest. This one here with the hair. I don't know, no idea, but I do recognize her from somewhere. But hey, maybe I'm just bugging out. Maybe I'm bugging out. But anyway, we move. 
we move. So next on the list, I talk about that. I spoke about that. Um, yeah, let's talk about these. I think I've, um, I think I've shared my controversial thoughts regarding the Nike Air Jordan One Lost and Founds are due to be coming out soon. Um, with me kind of being annoyed about the fact that they're kind of, you know, they're trying to kind of advertise these as a you know, them kind of going into the archives and reverse engineering an old 1985 pair of Air Jordan 1s in the kind of classic Chicago colorway. And then, of course, playing on the idea that it was sold in the mom and pop store back then. And then I got annoyed at it because essentially Nike single-handedly killed mom and pop stores by basically, you know, uh, making them have to take stock of other shoes in order to sell the stuff that they knew would sell out or like the tier zero stuff, which essentially killed them. And then having other big accounts come in you know which they weren't able to compete with kind of take away some of the accounts as well so a kind of combination of effects right market effects and just a brand um you know in terms of how they spy and let people buy stuff kind of changed but essentially they kind of helped kind of kill that entire industry of mom and pop stores maybe it would have died in general but independent sneaker stores that sell kind of really limited edition shoes don't really exist they're all kind of high street stores for the most part or big sort of like multi-brand online store retailer type things like Dover Street and whatnot but those kind of cool little quirky independent stores that you'd find in random cities where they sell you know a different selection of Nikes than you've seen everywhere else they don't really exist for the most part and Nike kind of played a role in it so I kind of was annoyed a bit about that I kind of was annoyed a bit about the fact that they've only started to do these kind of faithful retros only now it's taken them so long to actually do a faithful retro and I come from the era where they absolutely butchered the Nike Air Stab they butchered the structure they butchered the Nike Air Max Lite all these incredible um, shoes that essentially they had loads of reference points from because loads of people had the actual vintage each OG shoe that they could reverse engineer, which is basically taking the actual shoe, um, kind of um, dismantling it piece by piece and basically trying to remake each component with the pieces that you have available. Now, I know some of you say, oh, it's not possible, but it is. Adidas did it. Adidas made an amazing campaign. I think it was behind the Stan Smith was the first one where they basically was able to get all these um, vintage pairs of Stan Smiths when they originally came out. I don't know if it was the 80s or 70s, whatever they may be, in the same crinkly box and however crinkly they looked. And they were able to basically reverse engineer that Stan Smith and make it to, you know, and basically remake it. And they made it even, you know, with stained sole. They made it sometimes with a crease lever and a different type of laces and whatever it may be. And they were faithful, one of one sort of like, um, you know, uh, reproductions of the OG. And that ended up starting that kind of wave. And then that would led into the superstars um, coming back and looking quite vintage. I've got a pair even here that kind of look similar in terms of the shape. These are these are Nike SB version. Sorry, a skateboarding version of the superstar. But I does the same same sort of thing with the superstar where they actually made it faithful to how they originally came out in the 80s. I think there's actually a pair that they put out, a few pairs that were kind of like run DMC ones that they basically put out that were made to spec of how they were back in the day. So they obviously, it obviously can be done but for whatever reason Nike convinced sneakerheads all around the world that it's not possible to be done and it's too expensive even though Nike make billions and billions of dollars so I was pissed off to see that they finally got around to kind of figuring out how to do it nowadays but all that frustration aside all those moaning bits aside me complaining me hating the final images of the shoe have finally come out and it's safe to say this is definitely going to be a double up thing these are probably one of the only shoes maybe close to I can think of in recent years, like maybe the Tom Sachs Mars Yards, the first ones, um, maybe some Patters, maybe, maybe as well. I'm not really too sure on them. Maybe some Union Jordans that I didn't actually get, but I would have liked to No, I didn't get two of. I only got one, the Guava, but I would have liked to have gotten two pairs of the Blacks or something or two pairs of the Guavas. That would have been really cool. But there's not many shoes that come out where you're like, you know what, I need to double up on. I need to have one to rock and one to ice. So when the ones I rock die, I can replen them because that's the one thing that I like about doubling up on shoes because I know beforehand in previous years or in previous generations of sneaker culture you would double up on shoes so that you had another pair to kind of resell if you ever came into a tight spot 
But nowadays, I think reselling is still what it is. Don't get me wrong. There's more options now and that, and you can sell in different places. But I feel like nowadays, especially with the access you get, with the amount of places that sell stuff, and that it only requires you to fill out a form to get entered into a raffle, you're better off trying to buy as many pairs as you want, especially the shoe that you want to wear. Because once you wear it and you beat them into the ground, you're going to really hope that you had another pair. Like me, I had a Tom Sachs Mars Yards that I wore to the ground to the point where I'm wearing them to the gym. But I never got a second pair. But now they're just beaters I wear day to day. But I wish I had a second pair because to buy them again would be like, what, seven grand, five grand again. Do you know what I mean? It's absolutely incredible. So doubling up on these might be a sound investment, especially considering it's a Jordan 1. And you know how people are so crazy about Jordan 1 nowadays. It's like the number one premier Jordan. I think it always has been the Jordan 1, to be fair. Even though my favorite Jordan is a Jordan 4. The Tinker Hatfield design Jordan 4 is definitely my fave. I think even though he designed the Jordan 1 too, but the Jordan 4 is definitely my favorite because it's more like a cross trainer. And if you know me, you know that I'm an, you know I'm obsessed with the Nike Air Trainer 1 chlorophyll, the kind of old school one that Andre Agus used to wear back in the day that also was like a cross training shoe for like Bo Jackson and shit before he had the, obviously had his shoe. But the Jordan 4 has always been my favorite. But for whatever reason, the Jordan 1 has captured everyone's imagination. That's the premier Jordan that everyone wants. So when these end up dropping, considering the color, Away, considering it's a Jordan One, considering it's given given this vintage treatment that looks pretty decent now. Um, I know some of the in life pictures I saw people holding them didn't look that impressive. I hate the fact that they don't really lace the shoes. It's a little bugbear of mine, and being my bonnet that kind of gets me. Maybe because I've worked too many times in fucking you know sneaker retail to see this sort of stuff, but you can't unsee it. They need to relace the shoes. But regardless of that, they look flipping flames. You got a Chicago colorway, um, obviously with the red and the white and the black, and then up on the mud guard here, you got this crinkly, cracky sort of effect to kind of represent and um, being like vintage and cracking as well. Underneath there, that's pretty nice detail. And I just assume they will look a lot better in real life once you actually get a hold of them. And the other thing that I like too that they've done, they've gone to real detail to kind of get the box to look like the old vintage boxes because i remember buying a few vintage shoes i stopped buying them now because for the most part the ones i do buy end up breaking and crumbling and i don't have the patience to do soul swaps but one thing you do always remember kind of geeking out on was the boxes they, you know the with all the sun damage on the edges and shit seeing the sticker seeing the style codes what they call the name what not sometimes the wrapping paper would be different always smell funky those are always good bits to see so the fact that they went to such detail to get the box right again goes to show they had the technology to do this the whole time but they chose not to do it and now you know they're kind of catching up with everybody else and there's some additional images here again from over under that kind of give us another detailed look above it even the insole of the shoe they've got the insole kind of um label where the nike air is a little bit crinkled as well so it kind of matches up with the old school um shoes that you would get and how they would come about but yeah, the detail on them is pretty fantastic. I'm not going to lie. I'd actually like to see these done in other colorways. So maybe they'll put them out in like that white Zen gray colorway. Remember that colorway that um, for a period of time, I felt like all Ian Connor and Lucas Sabat were obsessed with and they kind of drove up the prices because they kept, you know, buying them and reselling them and shit. But those Jordan, I think those Jordan 85s, so they're all white with like a Zen gray swoosh. Hopefully they bring those out again. I mean, obviously like a black pair, I'd obviously be up for that too. And even the outsole looks like it's been given a, vintage treatment with some of the white little dusty parts all over it as well it's absolutely smoking i'm not going to lie so everything i said about it previously it might be hating a drop hating a release i take it back i'm gonna be trying to get a pair myself hopefully trying to get two and try and secure that with that one because these are definitely ones you want to double up on because you don't want to miss out on these and regret not getting a second pair because you're definitely going to wear them to the ground i know i will and then of course got the laces and then we've got this little fake mom and pop receipt thing that triggered me and got on my nerves because like i said nike played a role in killing the mom and pop stores but hey who cares who bloody cares the caption says Nike Air Jordan 1 lost and found official images releasing the 19th of November in four family sizing. So I've heard online too, people are saying that there's like been loads loaded into the Nike in, in inventory system thing. Honestly, sneaker buying nowadays is so much better and harder than it was before. You have so much info to your fingertips, but because everyone's a sneakerhead and they, for some reason, create this artificial scarcity with shoes and don't, don't just make more, it's harder to get it. So... It's a fucking double-edged sword. But anyway, it continues. Um, releasing November 19th with full family sizing. Retail price is at 180, 180 for adults, which is pretty cheap for a Jordan 1. Well, especially this 
kind of quality they're going for 140 for a grade school gs 85 for a preschool and 70 dollars for a toddler so you're going to see a lot of sneakerhead families not those kind of cringy night talk guys they're going to be buying them for the entire family him the wife the two kids and shit you're going to see loads of pictures of them kind of dressed up in them it's going to be fucking cringe for us a little bit but i don't care and they're going to be available on sneakers app and foot sites and obviously we're going to get them you know in other accounts i'm assuming too so i can't wait for those to drop i really can't they look absolutely amazing i take back everything i said about them definitely going to double up on those definitely going to double up on those there's no way around it quickly went to touch up on this because i thought this was pretty egregious um usually when it comes to me and these sort of like reality tv shows and people and whatnot i don't necessarily have any sort of deep thoughts about them as people I don't necessarily care and I'm not necessarily somebody that will kind of go out of their way to kind of say oh I don't know how you watch that sort of stuff that means you're dumb that means you don't have any sense that means you're an idiot da, da, da. I don't necessarily do that I think in general like what you like enjoy what you like um you know content is content and if they're providing entertainment for you then who am I to tell you not to be watching it is what it is I watch some dumb stupid things too we all do it we all have to kind of waste some time especially when we're bored but one thing I have always kind of detested, I think, about the Kardashians in general as a family is that I feel like they have no, like, what's, that, what's even morals? There's, like, no ethics in terms of the business that they do. They just kind of just do whatever is necessary to secure the bag. But then they also do this annoying thing that I hate, which is, yeah, hey, you can do what you want to, to secure the bag. But they also do this thing where they say, like, I want to do what I want to secure the bag, but then I also want to be treated a certain way. But to be treated a certain way, you have to kind of do certain things. And I think the lack of honesty they have in terms of the amount of work that gets done on them is a, is it's hugely annoying. And then on the, on the flip side, they always talk about how much hard work they put into how they look, but then they refuse to admit the amount of work they've done to give them the kind of platform to kind of, you know, to do what they want to do in terms of hard work. It's just annoying. Even if it's someone's business, what they do in terms of cosmetic surgery or what they haven't done, you can't be telling people that you do hard work. You do work hard and, you know, you have kind of fought for your position, but then you're not also willing to acknowledge your privilege or acknowledge the advantages or the, you know, whatever chances you've been given outside of the norm that kind of allowed you to get closer and closer to your success or whatever it may be. So it's kind of annoying, that sort of stuff. I've never liked it. But one thing that really kind of grinded my gears a lot during the pandemic was I suddenly started seeing, especially Kim Kardashian, posting these weird posts where she was like standing in front of like a Rolls Royce or a Bentley or something with loads of shopping bags from all these different department stores or brands that everyone knows and loves, like Dior, Gucci, whatever else exists out there in terms of people that follow that sort of stuff. And then promoting these like weird games or these NFTs or token, whatever it may be, right? And I remember seeing that sort of stuff, I think to myself, you're Kim Kardashian, right? You leaked to the press all this information about you making however much money per Instagram square for the brands that you kind of promote. You've got so many other different brands that you do on the side from hair stuff to makeup to lingerie to underwear to this and that, right? So many things that they do as a family uh, outside of what, you know, of them just existing. Do you really need an extra... I don't know, half a mil, a million from a random NFT company that wants you to share a product that's not even going to be around in a year or so. I always thought that was really gross. And to me, that kind of encapsulated why I'm not really a fan of the family overall because they have more money than they know what to do with. They have people falling over themselves to give them more money. They have a devoted group of fans who will literally do anything for them and buy whatever they put out and make however many excuses they want for them. And yet they take all that and basically try to swindle people out of money to make more money for themselves. No apology made after they get caught out and fined for it, nothing, just continue living. That's the one thing that I've always kind of pissed me off, and this story kind of touches upon it here. This is courtesy Los Angeles Times. It says, Dr. Kim Kardashian's SEC fine marked the end of the crypto celebrity gold rush. And I guess she's not the only person, but still, it's, it kind of you know hit home because I'm not really a fan of the family. It continues. Kim Kardashian just fined... Um, just got fined over a million dollars for boosting a cryptocurrency online, but she's not the only celeb with ties to the world of crypto. For many other A-listers who've thrown their weight behind cryptocurrencies, crypto companies, and non-fungible tokens or NFTs, Kardashian's 1.6 or 1.26 million settlement with the Securities Exchange Commission could mark a turning point in how Hollywood's biggest names think about their relatively unregulated online economy. The SEC aims to bring enforcement actions that will get widespread attention and influence of other market participants 
um, said the conduct going forward, um, said Philippe Moustakis, counsel of the law firm Seward and Kiesel. Naturally, an action against Kim Kardashian is ideal for these purposes. In short, he continued in email, the SEC is hoping that Kardashian, a media personality both off and online, will serve as an influencer of a different kind. Kardashians was fined for not disclosing that she had been part, that she'd been paid Imagine, this is fucking awful. Kardashians was fined for not this good that she's been paid for an Instagram post promoting Ethereum max crypto tokens. But she's not the only, the first big name directory hot water over crypto deals. Floyd Mayweather and DJ Khaled were charged in 2018 for not disclosing that they'd been paid for to promote various crypto investments. And in 2020, the same thing happened to Steven Seagal. According to one former SEC of um, officer a warning about celebrity endorsement of cryptocurrencies the agency put out in 2017 was largely prompted by mayweather jamie fox and paris hilton touting crypto assets and again all these people have loads of money they make loads of money they have loads of money on the horizon they're going to generate why jump on cryptocurrencies and all this sort of nonsense maybe because they're greedy maybe because it's too easy to turn down but essentially for the kardashians the main thing for me like i said is that they have so many what they call them in business vertical so many different brands and projects and stuff that they can work on at any one time that's bringing them multitudes of money and they still find a way to kind of fleece and scam their fans and like i said no apology no explanation no nothing to the fans just continue on continuing on absolute piss take but hey what do i know what do i bloody know continuing on and just touching upon this because i wanted to continue on talking about some other stuff concerning this big man it looks like kanye's account has been restricted both on instagram and twitter he has been restricted to some level um for his um very racy tweets that he put out there this courtesy of people it says Kanye West's instagram restricted and tweet removed for violating platform rules and guidelines Kanye West is facing action from meta and twitter after sharing what some have seen what some have deemed to be anti-semitic post instagram restricted the grammy award winner's account and deleted content from his page after he violated the social media platform rules and guidelines according to nbc news and cnn although a meta spokesman did not confirm to either outlet what content violated their rule in a now deleted post on Friday where she had a screenshot of a text between himself and Diddy in which he alleged um, people, he alleged, he alleged appeared, which he allegedly appeared, sorry, to show West claiming that Combs was controlled by Jewish people due to the jury he wrote in the caption reported NBC News. And of course, the other one that people were really irate about that he did that definitely got him taken off was this tweet that he put up but said the following, I'm a bit sleepy tonight, but when I wake up, I'm going to go DEFCON free not defcon 4 not 5 and onwards but free right in the middle on jewish people all caps the funny thing is i actually can't be anti-semitic because black people are actually jew also you guys have toyed with me and tried to blackball anyone who ever opposes your agenda so now he's suddenly became an anti-semite and he's going to start going into all this sort of like it's, it seems like the kind of classic um tick box for people that kind of newly adopt kind of conservative minds especially ones that go super radical they go all the way to the edge it's never like really kind of just general things that you want to pluck from the conservatives or the right side of republicans or whatnot it's always going right towards this line and it always going right towards this line and i find it funny that this stuff is the one that kind of got him banned and not the stuff about shooting up schools um not him essentially i would say goading people to violence but you know basically encourage people to try and fuck him up so that he can snitch on them not him attacking his wife sorry the, the mother of his children or mentioning his kids a million times all that stuff that maybe you, you would maybe deem as harassment i don't really show how you maybe police it because of stuff concerning people offline but still that stuff didn't really matter but when it comes to him talking about jews oof hands up everybody stop enough now we have to kind of report it that's the only kind of um weird thing about this story i'm not really surprised he got banned but the fact that this is the thing that kind of set it off means but obviously may, maybe it makes some sense thinking about it because he's essentially trying to rage war on an entire group of people right essentially by saying he's going to go defcon free like what are you going to do you're going to pull up to a synagogue with an ak in your hand are you going to you know throw years at their head like what are you actually going to do when you go defcon free so maybe they had a point to d delete and ban or restrict him but this is kind of the eventual end right and i'm wondering does this mean that we're gonna eventually see kanye on like sites like rumble and shit because those are now turning into like free speech platforms they're mostly you know free speech platform no 
Republican platforms or, you know, what you say need to be right wing platforms under the guise of free speech. But essentially, anybody that gets banned or people, you know, especially from like left leaning platforms, that's the first place that you go to. And they're doing something I think is quite interesting in that they're poaching people now. They're starting to take people even before they get banned onto the platform. They're paying big bucks for certain people. I saw the other day Russell Brand moved over there, right? Because I think he was getting hit with strikes and whatnot and yellow dollar signs in terms of restricted monetization on video, which basically means you make absolutely nothing. So all that sort of stuff is maybe affecting it. And I wonder if we're going to see one of these platforms actually take off because they don't really last too long, these platforms, right? Like a parlor and stuff. They seem to somehow get affected by something, whether it's market forces, whether it's, you know, um, some skullduggery in the background, but they don't seem to last too long. So I wonder if it would have to take more people, more prominent people getting banned from these main place, the main free, which is Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And then if you ban some of the main people who a lot of people follow, there may be a lot of their fans who then follow them if they go and flip in Rumble. But I think at the moment, it's still very, very niche. But it's an interesting proposition to see because clearly Kanye isn't going to stop talking about this stuff anytime soon. Um, if anything, like I said previous topics, he's only got worse if you're not a fan of the stuff he's talking about. I think ever since that Kanye, that Trump hug where he said Trump was his dad, he's only got progressively worse. He's, he's probably maybe, he was probably quieter throughout that period but he's definitely got worse in terms of his political views and his worldview so he's not going to change anytime soon especially with him being a what mid 40s man heading into his 50s i don't see him suddenly having a come to jesus moment where he kind of oh my god i'm bugging out i can't believe i did this or that this is the version of kanye you're going to get until the end of time um but i wonder what he's going to end up being on social media platforms will he end up being on twitter will he end up going back on instagram when it does when his ban or restriction is kind of lifted who knows who bloody knows in other news, I want to quickly touch upon this. This is an interesting tweet that has gone semi-viral in my little sector of the internet, which is sneakerheads who waste too much time wanking and pontificating about flipping shoes online. Um, this guy called Brandon Dune, who's a host of a podcast about sneakers on Complex and also does the news reporting on there and stuff. And, you know, it's generally a bit of a sound guy. A little bit of a dork, but, you know, dorks are sound and fun, especially when it comes to stuff like shoes and whatnot. And he wrote this tweet that I thought was absolutely hilarious because... I'm going to kind of link it to what's going on with Draymond Green and that Jordan Paul thing and also link it to another story that I heard some other American football player saying. So this Brendan Dune guy said in response to the recent documentary that Kanye put out, which is called Last Week, which is basically a kind of vlog thing that kind of surmises what happened, quote unquote, last week. And he also has in that little 30 minute documentary a scene of him basically berating the ADAS executives. And before he does, as a little power play, he plays this porn on his phone, like super loud. And he's got it on full screen. He actually rotates his screen to so it's like landscape view. And he basically is, is kind of doing a bit of a power play and telling one of the guys in the meeting that this guy in this video sounds like you. So I guess he's watching some European porn. I guess, you know, Kanye likes to watch porn of what, you know, those, you know, those kind of tasteful European porns where it's like shot in an amazing studio and the people in it look like they could have been models or one of them's a creative director or one of them owns a boutique or like owns a restaurant, you know, that kind of vibe. So maybe that's what Kanye was on. And he was showing him this video with this guy talking and he's, oh, this guy sounds, this guy sounds, this guy sounds like you. Like just really kind of creeping him out and doing a power play thing. And then I guess some people weren't happy with that because, you know, they just weren't happy with it because they got annoyed with it. <laughs> and one of the people that wasn't happy with it was Brendan Dune. So the following, if any other Adidas partner was doing that shit, that Ye is right now, the foul t-shirt and the anti-Semitic tweets, they would have, they would have rushed to cut ties. They've dumped employees for far less, can't hold people to different standards when it comes to brand values. Now, in theory, I agree with this, Right the world should be fair how i get treated as a um marketing assistant at adidas or as a brand assistant for no or as a head of nike energy global or something at nike or as a head of special products at converse whatever it may be i should be treated this, the same way as you know the blondie mccoys who do the stuff and whatnot or the whoever else is sponsored nike i don't really know you know what i mean like they should treat me the same way they should treat them or they should treat them to whatever it may be, right? Cool. But we know the truth of it. The truth of it always is that the talent 
always get treated differently than anybody else, especially the star talent or the star players. And I take it back to the whole Draymond Green, Jordan Paul thing. I'm sure most of you have seen it. And again, I'm not even a watcher of basketball. I can't even tell you the rules of it. I just know some of the players, but a clip went viral of Draymond Green from the Golden State Warriors and his other teammate in practice arguing. It looked like from a CCTV camera with no audio. They're arguing, they're having a back and forth. Um, the Jordan kid decides to say something, um, which then gets Draymond Green to come over. Jordan Paul then pushes Draymond Green and then Draymond Green with no hesitation launches into like a semi-flying Superman punch which knocks him straight out of his feet and he kind of holds him up as he's about to go down. So it's a crazy, crazy punch because the kid was completely out, right? And I was watching enough UFC to know that his knees completely went and he was absolutely out, out. So obviously that's happened and there's loads of rumors about, oh my God, they can't be the same team ever again. They're going to have to break them up. Someone's going to be a soldier. But nothing really happened. Draymond Green basically came out and explained the situation in a roundabout way. Um, and the organization basically said they're going to deal with it internally. But the main reason why is because, you know, uh, Draymond Green's one of the best players on that team from all accounts. He's a leader there. He's a veteran in some accounts too. He's been there, done it. Want, you know, they got that experience. So while the organization like Golden State let him go, given all that experience just because he got into a scuffle. And it's again, it's a serious scuffle. Anybody else, if you were not a good player, you probably would get booed at a team, but he's very talented, so he doesn't get booed at a team. Same thing could be said for Yeezy. If we take Kanye's word to be gospel, he didn't he mention recently that um supposedly flipping Yeezy accounts for like eighty percent of online I guess orders or something like that. If that's the case, then it makes complete sense why these executives at Adidas would sit in a white room on these really uncomfortable stores letting Kanye play German porn to them free flipping iPhone because he's fucking Kanye West and because he accounts for 80% of their sales, which uh, you would assume is some way linked to the bonuses that they get at the end of every year or whatnot. So it makes complete sense why they indulge him. That's always been the reason. And I've always said to myself, or I've always said in my little community of people that I talk to and often considering Kanye on forums and stuff, the main reason why I always think why he's always been like this and why it hasn't changed is because throughout the years he's been indulged. He's been indulged to the point where he, even his friends around him can't call him out. And now that he's made as much money as God, you know, it's impossible to call him out to tell him anything because he's basically in his head completed life. So if you can't help him, you know, advance any stages, he's not going to basically listen to you. Even to the point where he's saying, if you're broken than me, I'm not listening to you. But that's the reason why he's got indulged. He got indulged all those times, all those years, because he makes great music, phenomenal music, genius level music. He put on amazing live shows. Um, his fashion was pretty um, genre defining in a way. It kind of started a lot of trends. It captivated a whole group of people. Maybe not something that you're interested in, but people love their Yeezys. I always say when Yeezys first came out, they might have been one of the first times I saw a large a very varied and large group of people wearing a limited edition shoe. Like you'd see like an, an, you know, an Italian dad shopping in Selfridges wearing a pair of free, free fifties. You see some mom on a shop wearing a pair of free, like it was amazing to see that level of a sneaker appeal to so many different people, not just sneakerheads. So clearly he's got something. So that makes complete sense why I just haven't dumped him. Because anybody else, yes, Brendan Dune is right. Anybody else would have got dumped. But when you're Kanye, when you're Draymond Green, when you're these big people, you don't get cut. And then the last story I want to mention is some dude, I forgot his name. He's an American football player. He's the one that made a joke like, oh, CTE, CTE flying up. Whoever that guy is, he shared this story where he was in college and I imagine he was probably a stud back then. And he got into an argument with one of his teammates and he basically knocked him out in the change room, like punched him, one punch, bang. And he broke the kid's jaw even. And he just got taken into the flipping change room what do you get to the office or something and some and the manager instead of berating him says some joke to him or something and basically they kind of forgot about it never spoke about it again and just kind of continued on and nothing happened but why did that get allowed because he's a star player star players always get star treatment it just always is what it is because you know they're usually the rare thing to find a star player that's really good to add something to your team or to your organization so it makes sense why they wouldn't want to dump or cut ties with Kanye because he has essentially made them i wouldn't say relevant but he's helped them a lot in terms of a business so they can't go that quickly in terms of cutting them off they have to maybe approach it with some level of caution and maybe even hope that it's just a little period it's just a little 
um, phase because Kanye has this. He goes, you know, he comes online, he pisses everybody off, he starts engaging, and then he disappears for another six months. So maybe they're hoping that he, this will be it. He'll just disappear for another six months. Everyone will forget about this, and they can keep pumping out their Yeezys and colors that he doesn't like. Maybe, but I just thought the tweet was funny because it's like a you're not really paying attention to what's actually happening and who it actually involves. But hey, I understand the idealism in it. I understand the idealism. Moving on from that, we need to talk about uh, this. Yeah, let's talk about this. This is courtesy of TMZ. And I'm wondering, in general, if this is a good time to ask my audience out there, if, does Kanye need to be punched in the face? And do all men in their life need to have a point where somebody punches him in the face for the dumb shit that they say? Because, like I said previously, I think a lot of the reason why Kanye is the way he is is because he's been indulged throughout his life. But then if you also look at some of the old videos of his where he's kind of on a come up and he doesn't have much money or he's not that well known or he's not that, you know, whatever it may be, or his music isn't as great, he was still kind of talking this smack talk back then. He was still on this crud talk even back then when he had no money. So the issue that some people... I think will face when they try to lecture him, try to maybe see, make him see reason is that he was having that talk when he didn't have anything. Now he has everything. It's going to be pretty difficult to convince him what you're saying makes sense is right. Or is anything he should bother paying attention to. It's going to be very difficult because he wasn't listening back then. He's not going to listen now. But I also think in life, just because you say some crazy shit, you should face the consequences of your action. But it looks like with Kanye, he likes to goad people, get them irritated, essentially like a, you know, like the consummate troll. But then when it comes to them reacting violently, he then tries to cry Karen and basically snitch or whatever it may be. And this is what you get from this exchange here with Diddy. Really, really bizarre. So it says already, um, these attempts to reason with Kanye West over the White Lives Matter t-shirt controversy are falling on deaf ears with Ye dropping F-bombs while tripling down on his putting all those controversial gear on the market. And I think I've actually got the screenshots here that I can see the entire thing so I can kind of read them out to you. So yeah, these are the screenshots, um, you know, shared by Kanye, of course, on his account, which is absolutely insane to think that he's sharing screenshots with somebody as prominent as Diddy regarding this argument that they had. So in this first screenshot, it's got a text here with him talking to Puff, which is Diddy. And it's basically, I think, after the phone call they had. So they clearly had a phone call after, I think, Kanye saw the video of Diddy basically clarifying his earlier statements and saying, hey, I've now seen the shirt. I don't fuck with this guy at all. Don't buy this shirt. This shirt's garbage. And I guess they got on the phone and the phone conversation didn't go too well because Kanye tweets or Kanye texts Puff straight away and says, I didn't like our convo. I'm selling these teas. Nobody gets in between me and my money. This is my grandfather texting you now. <laughs> Never call me with no bullshit like that again unless you're ready to green light me, which is crazy, right? Him saying this because nobody who got, who got on that tea, because anybody who got on that tea is me. Out of respect for everything you've meant to me, I'll be quiet as Virgil, which is a fucking insane, rude thing to say. Um, I don't even know where to begin on that one. Um, but now I know I've hurt people I love with threats. Come do something illegal to me now, please. God is love, my brother misspoke to me, but I still love him. So he's obviously goading him, right? Just being an absolute cunt about it. Come to something to me illegal, please. That is incredible high vibrations, Karen levels of things, right? That he's kind of putting out there. Then another tweet, another text message thread here. It says, as soon as I land, we'll meet face to face. Send me the address. He says, nigga, fuck you. You fed. When really, Kanye is a fed. For him saying, you know, come do something illegal to me. Uh, and then I think one of the captions too, if I'm not mistaken, after his finish was like, a tweet was something like, oh, um, these guys are so dumb. I basically put them into my trap. And now if anything happens to me, the two main suspects will be Boosie and kind of Puff, Dead, Puff Diddy. Uh, Puff Daddy, sorry, or Diddy. It's just horrible. What, what, what an idiot. And they got another one. Um, Puff sends you another text saying, just being very direct. Send me the address, send me the address, send me the address. Let's stop playing these internet games and don't feel threatened. You'll be fine. Just love. And he tweets, text back says, um, this ain't a game. I'm going to use you as an example to show the Jewish people that told you to call me that no one can threaten or influence me. I told you this is war. Now go get you some business. Jesus is a Jew. Jesus Christ. So that's why I made you believe that I think 
some people need to get punched in the face some people need to face the consequences of their actions because the talk that he's talking now is stuff that you can't say sorry about it's stuff that you can't reconcile over a dinner over sending someone to rock or sending them a chair or giving them free shoes for life this is something that you need to run a fade with you have to it continues here Puff texts back and says, I'm just trying to talk to you as a black man. I'm talking to you because this is hurting our people. Stop. He says, anything you text, I'll post. I love you. So clearly, this is something that he's been talking about with other people and things that he said before, where he has this thing where there's no such thing as a private conversation, <laughs> which is a really good power play because it means that you get people to be on their best behavior in Texas because they don't want to end up on a jumbotron. And um, he says, um, and you guys are breaking my heart. I accept your apology in advance, which is the most yay thing ever to hear, right? And something that's incredibly rude also. Um, because, you know, you're essentially dismissing anybody's concerns about you or their questions or basically how they feel about you in general. But like I said, I still think this is grounds for Kanye to, for the argument to be had that Kanye more than anybody deserves to get punched in the face. Now, the issue is, He's clearly somebody that likes to talk a lot of shit but isn't ready to fight. But then the funny thing is in that video of him kind of, you know, trying to sun the Adidas executives, he does basically act very intimidating. He's kind of like in their space. He's talking with his hands. He's kind of being the big bad wolf. But you never really see him do that with black people, I feel like, for the most part. Maybe if they're musicians and they want to make an album with him, they're already kind of already in awe that they're going to work with the messiah so that makes more sense but i think in a general environment he doesn't act like that way around the blacks but when he gets around the whites he kind of flexes up and tries to become a you know this kind of gd chicago dude um so it was quite funny to see him kind of quiver and shake in his own way when diddy kind of pressed him a little bit but also remained a cunt so he wasn't like he was backing down he kept trolling he kept doubling down on the trolling but like i said i think um, he is somebody that maybe doesn't need to have a little bit of a spanking just to kind of get him in line. But something tells me, being an avid Kanye fan, I f you know, beating him up will probably make him into a worse person. It probably won't do the. It will probably won't have the desired effect that I'm thinking it will have. No way, shape, or form. This guy's been like this for a while, and I don't really see him changing anytime soon. So maybe I'm kind of wishing on the stars or myself when it comes to that sort of stuff. Maybe I am wishing on the star too. Then we move on. And we talk about this news, which is fucking amazing because it made me reminisce about some great and not so great memories. So this is courtesy of Hypebeast and it says, 21 Mercer, Nike Lab, 21 Mercer is closing next year. And if you know anything about 21 Mercer, you know it was like the premier Nike store in New York for a while. Um, we had a similar store here in London called 1948 in Shoreditch, which I worked in. I was one of the first group of staff that worked in there when it opened up in 08, That was to tie in with the Beijing Olympics. And the whole premise behind it was that it was sort of like the first Nike direct-to-consumer place that you could go and buy limited edition shoes. Because before that, you couldn't really buy limited edition tier zero shoes at a Nike store you basically can only buy them for the most part in like other retailers like tier zero kind of retailers and whatnot they had the weird times where they had little pop-up and activation things that you could buy limited edition shoes in nike town but for the most part you could only buy them um you know um, at these other stores so when 1948 opened the premise behind it was that they would sell nike sportswear stuff that's also something that started which was basically nike's version of streetwear but more sportswear you know what i mean like loads of baseball jackets loads of pants jackets and whatnot with loads of like um athletic -y type features like invisible pockets seamless things um tape seams uh waterproof fabrics gore-tex you know all these different core cool things like something you'd you'd maybe maybe you know used to be seeing at a brand like acronym or something right um loads of uh tech technical functional wear um or technical functional sportswear whatever it may be called so um i spent a lot of time working in that place and it was really really you know a good time but um that obviously closed a while back i think it may have closed in 2018 or something the one in london and this one in new york mercer the 21 mercer street store is finally going to close next year so it's been a while since it's been open so it follows on here it says because your oh, hype beast says following uh sorry following our favor in recent years are following falling jesus christ the spelling on this thing right um it's still the same one as i when i used to work there it was, it was the same people couldn't write for shit there was really no proofreading or you know 
editing or copywriting for the most part people there you just kind of threw stuff up there crazy um and wh when i was working there it was all run off wordpress I'm not sure if they're doing it the same thing but maybe i it is it says here um uh following falling out of favor in recent years nike lab 21 mercer uh, street soho is now set to close next year according to reports serving one of the sportswear giants main sneaker boutique locations and a special activation space in the past the 21 mercer which opened in 2008 served as an integral part of sneaker culture in New York. Though the destination for sneakers has fallen out of favor with the nearby opening of Nike Soho in 2016, reports now note that Nike Lab 21 Mercer is expected to shut its doors for good come January 2023. Although not much information regarding the space and surface has been revealed that the closure comes around the time of Nike's lease, of, of the end of Nike's lease on the location, Nike is encouraging staff to continue employment of the company while activations will uh, move to other locations. That didn't happen to me, by the way. When they ended up closing, no, not closing, sorry. That's what happened to me. I had to go through my history there. If I'm not mistaken, the reason why I wasn't working any there anymore is because at the time when I was hired, they went through two or three main heads of the Nike, I think it's, I think it's energy marketing. That's usually the ones that do all the cool stuff. So they had three different people working on that role whilst I was there. And that meant, obviously, when the third person came in, they wanted their own people in that store so they got rid of basically everybody except the manager i think at the time which was super annoying and then got their own staff in and then soon after it kind of closed which i was kind of punching here about and happy about because like oh go fuck yourself you know what i mean but in general we weren't really nike employees anyway we were always kind of seen as contractors we didn't really get paid directly by nike we got paid by another company who then invoiced nike it was just a weird thing in general i think they had to get around it in terms of like some laws around selling stuff i don't know what it was but essentially we weren't ever nike employees and because we were never in the office for the most part apart from some other times we had meetings in there or we kind of report back to marketing team here and there but for the most part we spent most of our time in a store and you know you had to be a nike you know you had to kind of if you want if a nike employee maybe had to come there to see us but in general we didn't really get to see many of the nike employees so it was very hard to kind of ingratiate ourselves in there um and then i guess when it did close they kind of just didn't think about us too much and they kind of just moved on maybe we didn't make, make a good enough impression i'm not too sure but that's really good that they're kind of doing that and kind of helping them out in that way and then um brendan dune actually wrote a pretty decent article about the whole thing here on complex which i'm going to get up i've had an exit oh i did i think i think i accidentally clicked x in there did i accidentally click x i think i did uh And then Brendan Dune obviously also wrote a pretty decent article about the whole entire thing titled Nike Lab 21 Mercer closing for good in January. It reads as follows. Um, sneaker industry sources told us that complex that Nike lease on the 21 Mercer space was um, expiring in January that the store was set to close in response to the inquiry on Friday Nike confirmed that it would close the store in January 2023 while it will be closing 21 Mercer its physical space will be carrying its community focused vision through key activations and our existing Nike our existing, sorry NYC retail locations our digital ecosystem as well as our marketplace partners Nike said that the store closes staff are being encouraged to continue employment at Nike by applying for other roles at nike which is fucking brilliant the store opened in 2008 as 21 mercer its debut marked a by a block party attended by the likes of spike lee and roger federer mercer was famous to part for his bespoke first services a sneaker customization offering that lets shop shoppers book an appointment to design nike force ones or mx ones for around 800 dollars do you remember that there was a time in life where Nike ID was only invite only. You couldn't do it as easy as you can now where you can basically just select, you know, colors online and stuff um, and kind of do like a paint by number shoe. Back in the day, you had to kind of be invited to go down there. But it was a pretty sick experience because usually you had to kind of go down there and you'd kind of meet people who were maybe interns or coming up in the Nike flipping design space team, thing, whatever, maybe in terms of making things. And they'd run you through the materials They'd kind of give you help in terms of what colors work best together applications finishes all that really good stuff and usually if i remember correctly too because it was the 800 dollar mark one you could
could change loads of different things. You could even change the eyelets in terms of having metal rings around them. You could change the stitching. You could do loads of things that you can't effectively do always on the Nike ID thing. Now I think they kind of ramped it up and basically give you most of the options online. But back in the day, you can only do you know the the panels you could only change online and then the bespoke thing was only to change like the extra stuff like maybe the insoles the stitching the tongue colors the different laces maybe you could have the sh each shoe be a different color as well all that good stuff happened so it was a pretty sick service to be fair and i think if they brought it around nowadays considering how big sneaker culture is now especially sneaker customization i think it'll go down really well but maybe they have more better data than me in the back end that says it's not as actually that true but it continues uh in its early days nike Tony mercer was a nike owned sneaker boutique and marketing tool but it also kind of a meeting place for nike street where con con heavy that word is but yeah definitely the same thing in london that's what i loved about most about the store it was truly a hub says samantha groteski who was one of the original staff members of the store people who visited became like permanent fixtures and included extended store staff members so yeah you know you could get like a nice little piece on there about it and I had a similar sort of experience, like I said beforehand, like I was one of the first employees that worked at the 1948 store here in London. Um, it was a pretty sick time, I'm not going to lie. And it was really cool because that was one of the first jobs I got um, outside of like working regular retail jobs where I kind of got it off the strength of my kind of personality and the fact that I was around and the fact that I had a bit of a name in the scene. I was on forums a lot. I had a pretty popular blog back then. And I was just being kind of like a, you know, a man about town or a kid about town at that time. And I kind of befriended one of the main people at Nike who was working there at the time. He kind of took a shining to me and then basically recommended me for the store that they were about to open. I had no idea they were going to open it. And he basically recommended it, to rec put me forward for it. I didn't have to do a presentation for it, like a whole activation presentation type thing, um, was selected and basically got the job and joined like a few other people that kind of were very prominent in the scene doing it too. And it's funny because everybody that kind of was working in that place has kind of gone on to do their own little cool thing creatively, you know, whether it's consulting, being an assistant, being a uh, model, being an artist, whatever, DJs, everyone that I was worked with in that store has kind of gone on to do amazing things. And even our original manager has now gone on, I think he works at Essex now or something, as one of the people who kind of, as heading up all the quote-unquote special projects they do over there. So it worked out pretty well. Um, but it also was a kind of bittersweet time because, like I said, we weren't really Nike employees. We were kind of, we were effectively, um, what's that called it? We were effectively, um, what's that word called? Oh. You know, I, I basically said the word before, but we weren't exactly Nike employees. We didn't really have any kind of connection with Nike overall. So we kind of just had the store. And then at the time as well, the store was going through some weird politics. And I saw what kind of sneaker stores are actually like on the inside. And it kind of grossed me out in terms of, you know, the backdooring of shoes, in terms of the scratching your back, I'll scratch your backs type of stuff. It kind of really annoyed me because at the end of the day, I'm always still going to be a customer first and a fan first um, as much as it's as I enjoy kind of being on the inside and being kind of let at, let in at the front and getting VIP and getting stuff put aside to me. I like all that stuff. It's fine. Don't get me wrong. But still, my, the main reason why I came into some, I love it mostly is as, as a fan. I think every fan should have the ability to be able to buy the things that they want to buy, um, especially if it's kind of fair. And I guess in those kind of stores, it wasn't because some of the stuff that was getting dropped was only if you're dropping in limited, limited quantities. And then certain people would find out and you wouldn't even know how they would find out in terms of how much quantity we got. And they'd be like getting the stuff before the store even opened. They'd be in the back trying it on. And you'd be thinking to yourself like, rah, boy. So all those times I used to wait and queue in, in, outside the shops trying to get hold of limited edition shoes. I had no idea that the time that I wasted sleeping here was legitimately a waste of time because somebody has already accounted for my size, you know, from the comfort of their own home. They're in their own bed sleeping under a duvet and here I am in the street on this flipping horrible camping chair hoping that I can get a size 10. But it's already been accounted for because it's been backdoored. So I kind of hated that stuff. Even though I partook in it myself and I kind of, you know, got some favours out of it myself, it kind of made me disgruntled. And I think that maybe help my kind of standing in the place my attitude wasn't the best i kind of just you know kind of became a little bit of a maybe bad influence in terms of how my mood was overall because i didn't like all that kind of clouty clicking up kind of too cool for school shit um and then i think whilst i was there actually maybe it was whilst i was there the original guy that actually recommended me for the role um 
I ended up having a big falling out with him and that kind of eventually led to me kind of just, you know, you know what, fuck the scene. I'm not involved anymore. This stuff is absolutely annoying and really frustrating because, you know, I, I kind of came into it wanting to be the next flipping Hiroshi Fujiwara or, you know, looking up to the James Jebbias of this world, looking up to the Michael Copperman of this world and then you get in it and you see all these kind of middle management kind of like, you know, entry level people acting like they're bosses when they're not really or just having incredibly big egos when all they do is put on parties and DJ it's like bruv like it's not that serious do you know what I mean like no one gives a shit and the egos were just incredible and I think one time I had like a really really bad you know kind of interaction with this person I don't even sure what actually happened to Dita but I do remember it kind of ending in a kind of shouting match and I remember just thinking you know what that might have been partly my fault maybe majority my fault but the reason what, what I'm going to do, because I can't control the flipping actions of others, I'm just going to take myself away from this because I know clearly back in the day I used to live for this. I would be up outside queuing outside of a sketch or whatever. It may be a place where they're doing these, you know, kind of guestless only party shits. And I'll be happy to stand there and be talking with my friends. But but it got to a time I was like, no, nah, I don't want this. I want to be an absolute participant of this. I want to be affecting culture on the inside, but also not by doing this. I want to be actually doing things. And I thought, you know what? The only way I could do this is by stepping away um, because this is starting to make me toxic. So then I ended up kind of stepping away from that and kind of end up doing my own thing. And to be fair, it kind of did end up hurting me, I think, overall, because a lot of the people that kind of stuck with it ended up getting some pretty cushy jobs, the kind of jobs where you don't actually do much. You just kind of, you know, um, you kind of uh, coast along on your core factor, which at the time I had a lot of kind of clout tokens in my little piggy bank that I could have used. But I guess once you step away and you're not around, um, people kind of forget you, you kind of, you know, disappear into relevancy and then people kind of, other people come in and replace you and kind of do the thing. So it's all well and good. But overall in terms of life, happiness and stuff in my terms of direction and my output now i think it's for the best i think if i were hanging around there i probably would have been disgruntled i probably wouldn't end, end up like some of those old bitter guys that are still in the scene that are still begging stores for connects to buy shoes and they're flipping that supreme trying to beg friend with the sales assistants and they're just cringy right they were at all the flipping sceny things events wise in terms of art basil and paris fashion week men's and shit and just hanging around you, know, you just see them around you don't know what they do they just hang around hoping for somebody to give them a little a little inner or something and i'm glad i didn't do that i'm glad i kind of made my own way my own in my own way yeah it's kind of a bit you know it's a bit all over the place maybe not the most polished thing in the world maybe it doesn't really have the best direction in the world but still i did it on my own and you know i'm happy with that i didn't have to kind of you know depend on these guys because these guys also are the ones that if you owe them a favor they'll definitely let you know do you know what I mean they'll definitely hold it over your head and kind of use it to you know kind of come back and you know try and curry like I remember that happened actually at 1948 I think it was around a time when what Air Force oh it was an Air Force One that dropped originally I'm not sure if you remember it. it was sort of like a brown boot Air Force One it kind of looked like a Timberland it was like all leather and it was really nice and I guess at the time we all kind of liked it in the store everyone kind of bought a pair to kind of have and I think at the time too we had an amazing discount there we had to get I think we got like two free two staff two free shoes each season plus a discount so yeah, I, ended up, I had so many shoes back then it was absolutely insane um, I remember this brand pair of shoes was really popular and I guess because we all liked them whoever I didn't like at the time I was working at Nike basically found out a way to get us all a pair before they dropped but then at the time I kind of thought this is a bit weird because this guy's really slimy and then it turned into him basically having a favor over our heads so that he basically then ended up doing this thing which was quite clever but also really kind of nasty where because he ended up getting all of us these shoes that we wanted he ended up then basically having us owe him a favor each of us the manager the other staff members so basically five of us all owed him a favor so he could call up and say hey is Agostino there and have this film done done. Hey, is that guy there? Had that done, had that done, have that done. It was kind of awful to see in real time. Like that's how the scene works. Um, to see it kind of happen in real life. But it was also good because I got to bump into people like James Jebbia from Supreme. I spoke to him for a couple of minutes when he came to visit the store. That was absolutely sick. And it was cool too because when I got to speak to him, it was good to get that reaffirmation that I always knew that the people that actually make the stuff, the actual people that are like, you know, the ones that are important the founders of these companies, the creative directors, uh, the CEOs, the ones that are actually running the business, they are always safe. 
It's the ones who are just, you know, the fucking receptionist, the styling assistant, the photographer's assistant, all these flipping, you know, ex auxiliary characters are usually the cunts because for the most part, they know maybe deep down that their job could get taken at any time. So they don't, you know, they're kind of wary of outside people because that could potentially be a threat to your role, which I get. But just be cool, man. Be cool. It's not that serious. It's just clothes and trainers. It's not that serious. And if you're framing your entire personality around trainers and clothes anyway, you are probably a wild lad. Do you know what I mean? You probably need to get some better hobbies um, that doesn't involve, you know, plants and shit, like something else, like actually hobbies that involve other humans, that involve you going to different places or maybe meeting some regular people that aren't always involved in cool industries and shit because that was also something that used to bug me. All the conversations in there just revolved around sh photo shoots and magazines and stuff. I was like, come on, bruv, like you guys must just watch like trash TV. No one really played sports there or watched sports or watched football. There was no good football banter. Everything was dumb. Like it was just, it just really pissed me off in a way. So I'm kind of glad it kind of ended the way it did, even though I was one of the first people to kind of get let go. The other, the other group of guys ended up hanging on a lot longer than I did. But still, you know, the fact that we were contractors then, so that's what I meant, contractors, um, meant that we were always getting paid late because we had the invoice. It was just a, it, it was a real nightmare behind the scenes. It looked quite cool on paper on the outside, but behind the scenes, there was a lot of flipping thunderstorms and rainstorms that we had to kind of navigate through. But the parties were good in there. All the activation events were absolutely sick. Um, they really kind of, you know, um, opened up the checkbook when it came to that sort of stuff. And I think the first time I went back there, actually, ironically enough, because I vowed to never go back there after they fucking let me go, um, they didn't actually let me go. It was more so the person who came in to replace the other energy marketing person when they own people. So it wasn't like they told me go fuck off. It was like they just didn't tell me to come back again because, you know, we we're, were basically, you know, contractors. So we got like a week by week rotor. And in one week, I didn't get a rotor. So I didn't go in. <laughs> But I remember I vowed not to ever go there again. Like, fuck them, I'm never going there again. And the one time that I did visit there again, you know when, the, when that was? When the Nike 10 collaboration happened, the Virgin I Blur collection. So that happened, and then somehow I guess I won um, the first slots, which were, I think I won them off the back of getting into one of the panel discussions. I think it was the one with he did with Kim Jones, I think. I think it was that one. So I got into that one, and then that allowed you to also buy a shoe. So I ended up having to, I ended up, buying two actually i don't know how i got the other one but i ended up having to buy two i resold one kept one and that was the first time i went back to the store because i had to go pick them up there crazy isn't it fucking crazy the first time i ever went back to 94 years was to go pick up the the flipping jordan ones um the off-white jordan ones that came out uh during the whole nike 10 collaboration thing but yeah man r.i.p 21 mercer um you know you probably hanged on a lot longer than you probably should have but you definitely probably played a big role in your local scene the same as 1948 did when i was coming up and you know as bad as it ended it was really a cool shop anywhere in store you know allowed me to meet some interesting people probably set me on my journey that i'm on at the moment now who knows i probably wouldn't have been here if i wouldn't have gone through that kind of education and schooling even though i fell out of a lot of people and a lot of them if i was to see them now i probably would fight them just because i'm that kind of guy i know it's just bad i kind of hold a lot of that kind of stuff inside of me sometimes and i let it out all at one time so it can kind of get a bit sticky but still um i'm happy i did um go through that situation so pick up everybody associated with 21 mercer hopefully you guys do actually get um you know the benefit of applying for nike roles that i didn't get because that's a pretty sick actually they're doing that really really cool on them to do that actually and even if you don't it's still a good thing to put in your cv because people are always interested in those kind of spaces and how they work because essentially all the new things you're seeing now with pop-up shops and you know co-working spaces they kind of come from the back of that that was sort of like the first iteration of a pop-up store a, you know a multi-use space um you know the furniture there was no permanent fixtures in there if i think if i remember correctly just a stock room everything could kind of be everything was modular it kind of be moved around the places and stuff it was really really interesting everything around it um so yeah big up everybody associated with it you guys are all sick hopefully you guys go on to bigger and better things off the back of it bigger and better things and then i think that's it I think I'm going to end the action as you can show episode number 608 on that one. Hopefully you've enjoyed it. Hopefully you've had a good time as I have. And I'm going to see you guys on the other side. Peace.
Oh no, if you listen to the audio podcast, you hear a song. That's what you're gonna hear. But if you listen to watch the video, you definitely hear me go uh silent and it fades to black. But yeah, thank you for checking me out. And as per usual, make sure you like, make sure you flip in, subscribe if you want to come back. You can always click the links in my bio to check out other things concerning myself or check out my site, excellencedinger.com to find out more information with stuff that I do. And I'll see you guys soon. Peace. Peace.